All right, so use cases. <coughs> what would, what, how would you use this? So we've talked about where people might use it. Um, there's some interesting ways in which uh, our customers are looking to use this. And probably the number one of these is native S3 apps. So if you're out of college, you've just spent the last four years getting a computer science degree, you probably didn't learn how to write to iSCSI blocks or file systems. You probably learned how to write to object storage because that's what they're teaching now. And so we have a whole new generation of developers. Their default development environment is something like AWS or Azure or GCE, where the backend storage is all persistent object storage. Um, so there's, what, in the AWS store, there's 40,000 apps that can talk to S3 today. Now, not all of those are portable outside of Amazon, but a lot of them are. And then any new app development, we have a number of customers we've talked to that have already gone down this path and are putting things in object storage. So for them, moving to this internal private cloud model is either already something they've done and we can help them with their capacity or it's something that they're doing now. So this is a, a, a trend we're seeing across almost all the customers we're talking to. Uh, mobile applications, and this is where it starts to get interesting because we have um, ongoing partnerships and discussions with customers about recreating things like a Dropbox for private universities. You know, 25,000 students all engaged primarily in research. They don't necessarily want all of their files sitting on a bunch of departmental filers like traditionally universities have done. They also don't want them out necessarily on public cloud. So they are building services to provide to their students that give them the feel of apps they are used to on their phone, on their, on their tablet, on their desktop but keep the data inside the university. Um, so that's actually a really interesting use case. There are also similar efforts um, at enterprises to do things like internal private video channels, something that looks like a YouTube for your company. This is actually a really interesting way to distribute news and information. Um, for some companies that do a lot of media production, it's a really interesting way to just see what is everyone working on? Um, and it's an internal private YouTube channel. And again, you've got to have data storage for that. Uh, backup and archive. So almost all of the backup vendors at this point will support S3 as a target. Um, the ones that don't are working on it. So this is a huge opportunity and it's not even necessarily tape replacement but again it's tape augmentation. So the media and entertainment folks that we talked about, they have uh, insurance requirements to put things on tape. Until those insurance requirements change, they're going to have to put things on tape but they want a place where they can get back to their media files faster than tape. So we can be an intermediary spot for them uh, in their backup process. Um, same with lots of enterprises. If you take um, any enterprise that's backing up to tape today and ask them, how much, how much have you restored from certain things of this? They can probably identify a large subset of that that they would like to have faster access to. And then data analytics, this is a, a very interesting use case. So Hadoop and Spark um, have something called the S3A connector, which is um, the second generation of S3 access out of, out of that Apache project. Um, the folks at Ampledate have actually contributed code to this project, and in Hadoop 2.7, um, you can use S3A as a replacement for HDFS. So if you look at a Hadoop cluster here, instead of having a local Hadoop file system, you could do that communication all over S3A to a dense, fast object storage system. Now that gets really interesting if you are trying to do multiple sets of analytics with multiple types of analytic engines because your data can all live on a single place. If you're transitioning from Hadoop batch jobs to real-time Spark jobs, you could still do both against the same data set. So that becomes a little more interesting than having to have two different clusters dedicated to two different things. And I'll close with, how do we try this out? So we have a customer proof of concept center here in Santa Clara um, in our uh, Colo facility. It's really difficult to ship a 2,500 pound rack to people for testing. So we have provided a way for people to either do functional testing um, over an internet connection via S3, to do performance testing locally inside our Colo with uh, machines that we provide for customer data. Um, and we've gone through, I think, 10 different customer proof of concepts now over a wide range of customers that have all been actually very successful. Um, and uh, that, that has made it a lot easier for us to demonstrate to people how simple this, this works and how performant it is. And that is the end of my slides. So you only do S3. 
today. Mm. Today. Okay, today. Right. <laughs> yeah. we, we, are, we are considering other, other methods of ingest, yes. Yeah, because if we're talking about archive type stories, there's a bunch of it that's already out there. Absolutely. So that means that you have to either wait for those solutions that are managing the storage already to support an export to S3. Yeah so that you can then take over the and in, in many cases, some of those are happening. Um, so there's a, uh, there's a protocol that's in use, uh, this is particularly in Europe, but um, in the academic community called IRODS. And IRODS uh, just recently added an S3 capability to their protocol. So that's something that universities will use to move research data around between different tiers in their, in their, from HPC all the way to tape. And now there's an S3 connector available for that. So that's, that's one thing that's been added. But yes, we're, we're looking at other protocols. <laughs> If I understand you correctly, are you saying that that IROD is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. So that sort of spoofs the full system into knowing, I mean, to believing it's an S3 system and then allows you to uh, ingest that into your device? So IROD is almost an ILM like system for university research data. Oh. So it's got the capability of a data mover that moves things around based on their requirements and they've added S3 as an endpoint for, for one of those data movement engines. So instead of saying moving it from Lustre to a near-term near -term file system to tape, they might move it to an archive first, depending on when they're expecting to reaccess that data. And one other thing you said, uh, I think it's one of you, sorry. That's all right. Um, talked about white boxes. Am I to infer that you're going to white box your system, or you're saying that you're going to be priced comparable to white boxes? That second I'll bit. take this question. But that's a good one. Yeah. So, um, in, I think that's a great way to actually close out the, the session in some ways before we get to real Q&A. Um, what we're trying to create is for the next generation cloud um, providers, with tier two and tier three, we're not talking really about the first tier guys who really have very deep knowledge on how to build cloud infrastructure. We're trying to create that environment for the people that don't know how to build a cloud infra infrastructure. And that's the key to what the company, when we say we want to be best of breed in cloud infrastructure, we're not talking about hardware, we're not talking about white box, we're not t talking about just selling enclosures. We're talking about selling cloud infrastructure. So it becomes as simple for you as you roll in a rack, you plug in power, you add your network connection, you have access to the cloud. So it is a cloud in a box at, at a hyperscale level. So that's what we got to think of. Getting back to your question about uh, white box, we will be uh, an infrastructure provider at the cloud level. So we will always be providing that um, S3 interface for you. Just take a look at this picture here. And you're going to see this in real life very soon. You've got the basic storage enclosure. You've got your storage controller nodes that control that storage. You've got your um, object level um, storage, uh, sorry, infrastructure. And you've got your networking. How long do you think it would take you to get all of that, all of it talking to each other and working perfectly if you were um, an IT guy today that has never used any, mm -hmm. that has had no experience with cloud infrastructure? A day, a week? A month? Never? Would they ever get it right? <laughs> Correct. What we're trying to do is take that extreme complexity and say, you don't have to do that anymore. Your expertise is in building applications that talk to an S3 interface. We will do all of this infrastructure. We are effectively your integrator to the level where we're providing you just your basic cloud interface. That's how simple we're, this is what we mean by simplicity at scale. We're taking that expertise that currently only certain companies have in-house and it is extremely difficult for, you know, traditional, you know, companies like our, you know, who've been in what I would call second platform expertise for a long time. <coughs> they don't even know where to start. And this becomes very clear. Even we've talked to companies that are, you know, their whole business has grown up on the web. But, they have, but their business has been, um, they have not built their own infrastructure internally. We're having conversations like, do you do failover? Do you do snapshots? Do you do replication? And it's clear that they don't yet even have the language or the conversation that you need to have to understand how to build out cloud. Because you don't go to your Amazon and say, how, how many snapshots a minute are you doing? That is... That's a traditional array um, level 
protection that was built in for primary storage. This is a completely new model. It is really third platform is about um, how, it, how durable is my data. By the way, 15 nines, just so you know what the reliability model in that is, that's one in a quadrillion. Now, we all know one in a billion, we can kind of get that one in a trillion. I had to look up what a quadrillion <laughs> was. And by the way, I don't know how to spell four it. Four of them. It's four of them. It's just like <coughs> quadrillion soy latte. It's, it's, latte. it's, it's, <laughs> it's really big. It still doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's the, so that's my it's point. It's not human. It is a different language. It's about geodispersion. It's about you can't make replicas of 40 exabytes of data and, and, and affordably store it. That's why the simple replication model that's been, that was why, I mean, it was what worked for everybody in the beginning with Google, with everybody, triple replication. It's very simple. The problem about that is that cost model stays with you for your lifetime. So you're always costing 3x what you actually have in data value. That's why erasure coding has to become the language of the next generation object store because now you're talking about 1.4x versus 3x. That's a huge difference when you get to massive scale like we're talking about. And as human beings, we don't have the concept of how to scale exponentially. We understand linear scaling, which is why nobody ever can figure out their 401ks because <laughs> we think linearly, but data growth is exponential. And that's, that has a huge issue in terms of forward thinking. So what we see ourselves here is an infancy. We're at the infancy stage of true cloud build out. And it's tools like this that you're going to have to have to be able to do that. So would you be, oh, sorry, after you. Just, Thank you. Thanks. Would you be targeting any other cloud provider going forward? We're actually having conversations with people who provide cloud services. So when you think about, um, if you, uh, I'm, I'm using um, uh, people that are doing sync and share services, right? Their expertise is developing the software, but they don't have the expertise to go out and build the cloud infrastructure. And at some point in time, you know, the cost of doing that in the public cloud becomes prohibitive for your business. So there's usually a desire to bring that in-house, either for security reasons, for example, HIPAA compliance. Um, there are specialty vendors who are providing services to hospitals, and they guarantee the HIPAA compliance on, on your personal information, your healthcare information. They don't have any expertise in cloud infrastructure. So they're looking to vendors like us to say, you provide me my plugin so that I just can go ahead and, and uh, focus on the software layers above that that provide the HIPAA compliance. We're, that's not our job, that's their job, that's their value add. That's what we're really focusing on. There's also, to, to that point, there's also um, a whole class of, how do we say this, um, distrust of certain public cloud vendors. Um, and I specifically refer to folks outside the United States who for various reasons don't want to put their data um, on an, uh, a US-based cloud vendor, whether that's for security reasons, whether it's for perception of security reasons or other things. Snowden. Yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is a huge opportunity in matter. places like Europe, again, going back to some of the things like national archives, um, public clouds there, where they want to build these types of services, they may not want to put them on Amazon services, I'm sorry, in Ireland, if they live in Germany and their local data requirements say your personal data must live inside our borders. So there's a, a large number of those kinds of opportunities where their data growth is just as big as everyone else's, but they can't go to the public cloud for various reasons. So helping them build private cloud infrastructure that stays within their country's borders is a very interesting opportunity for us. And there's actually, you know, we, we, we consider, we call them the IA. There's a, you know, global list of very large vendors um, who have tremendous expertise, more than we'll ever have in how to build our cloud infrastructure. And then there's uh, the total number in the world is, is in excess of 300 vendors who consider themselves cloud infrastructure players. So that's almost all of the rest of the industry. You know, they're, they're small, local, uh, regional cloud vendors. A lot of our traditional integrators that, that we used to know today in the US are now providing services. They are providing cloud services. But their expertise is in the customer relationship, in the management, in billing, and all those other kinds of things that have to take place. 
and we're the infrastructure platform you can put behind that. That's what we're, that's our value add and that's where we want to focus our efforts. So it seems to me that if the, I, that your typical IT shop doesn't have the vocabulary, even the thought process of, of talking about these technologies, then they probably also don't have the sort of, um, and the business, that don't have the thought process for deciding which data use cases, which data stories would be a fit here versus a traditional replicated either on-site or in the cloud. So we, you said in the beginning that that's up for the customers to decide, but who helps them? Because if they don't have the thought process for the infrastructure, I'm guessing they don't have the thought process for the use cases either. Well, I actually think that um, you're, you're actually addressing a very interesting dynamic that is happening within these companies because they are encouraging their own engineering teams to go make these you know, uh, different applications happen. And the natural place they will go is, it's called DevOps. The natural um, cycle is they say, hey, you know, I've got, I, I'm gonna write this app and I think it's going to be able to query my data and it's gonna be able to do this. I need some compute and storage really fast. Okay, where do I go? I go to the public cloud. Over time, that application gets you know vetted gets QA'd gets validated gets everything and at some point in time it becomes now it becomes your value add as a company and uh, economics will decide whether that makes sense to run in the public cloud because frankly at 4.7 petabytes um, you have to be a large-scale you know um, application at that point in time before we make sense but there's a point in time when you say you know what for security reasons for whatever reasons I want to bring that in-house Mm -hmm. So that is the point in time when you can just you know, migrate effectively that application to an in-house uh, solution because it's a simple S3 uh, interface, so there's no requirement for you to change your app. So it sounds like you're positioning this as um, this is an application infrastructure decision. I guess I sort of was thinking of, because we're talking archive about hot data and cold data, and that I can think of things like in the world I work in, in retail, my transactions for the last whatever, 90 days or something, I want them still in my point of sale for all kinds of reasons. Right. But my transactions from three years ago, where someone still wants to get pull up things for warranty information or something, doesn't need to be there. Is that, am I not understanding that that's a use case for that this That is definitely well? a use case. In, in, that, in that scenario, we, we definitely have to sit down with not only the customer, but their application providers, their VAR or whoever does their infrastructure for them mm -hmm. today and start to work out, does this make sense in your environment? Mm -hmm. Where does that data live today? You know, if right. it goes to tape, how can we help you keep it off of tape and make it more yeah. accessible? And again, some of those applications are gonna require the right connector. Mm -hmm. um, and as we go forward, you know, we will likely be adding, uh, to your point, more connectors and more capabilities. Um, we had to start somewhere and S3 is like the logical default place to start. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we, if we add things like other object storage um, APIs like Swift, you know, over time, that will also enable us to go into other places that, that need those things. And you, you bring up a great point. This infrastructure isn't, a lot of it isn't here today. I, I had a personal experience recently with my own um, credit card company. I wanted the ability to be able to take all of my 12 months of, of credit card information drop it into Excel and be able to sort it myself because they give me these reports that say, you know, you spend X amount in entertainment. What does yeah. that mean? It doesn't make, make, it's really junk, <laughs> right? So I said, I, I, I actually emailed them and said, I want the 12 months of data and they, and I, they only give me 90 days. Yeah. I can do it for 90 days. And they said, no, sorry, we really appreciate your valued customer and you've been a great customer of ours, but we only store for 90 days. Download every month. That's and you have to download <laughs> it every month. And I thought, you know, excuse me, but we're in the 21st century. <laughs> we have a completely mobile youth growing up who have no concept of the idea that it is archived off to tape after 90 days. It's mm -hmm. true. And, and I mean, I wrote back to them and said, please, you know, this is, this is, not, this is not the way we want to do it. That is where there's an opportunity for this type of product. So they don't have, because they are putting it off to tape. Um, our medical records, by the way, our, um, in my local hit thing, 90 days. An x-ray is on tape after 90 days. Yeah. It is incredible how fast they're moving those images. Anything that's image-based gets off the system really fast. Mm -hmm. So 
your your example of the broken by the way i've had three broken bones in the last three years so i very <laughs> personal experience of this um that's the kind of um medical um healthcare challenges they have mm -hmm. because there isn't a natural fit for where to put that data and because i what i'm seeing is i mean this is a business decision of how hot and how live this data is so 90 days the business has probably asked the IT people how much does it cost to keep all the data all the time and the IT guy says we'll just keep it for a day <laughs> right <laughs> because that right. makes his system perform faster and his backups <laughs> take less time of course and then so it seems to me that there's this also this gap in addition to a third platform there's a third analysis service to understand the metadata and the business cases and all the exceptions for when you need this this type of solution Absolutely. or any of them Absolutely. to make that decision and it shouldn't be left up to devops like you said no and, and in many cases the companies you know it depends on the industry some industries are farther along this journey yes. than others um mm -hmm. i think finance and healthcare are probably at the tail end as they tend to be a lot of times in it um but they're also at the forefront of the data explosion. So they have more data problems than almost anyone else, but they're also slower to change. Mm -hmm. So that um, is driving many of them in, in cases to look at cloud, um, whether it's internal or external, um, as a solution to their problems, but they still have to figure out how long do we keep this? Some of them have, you know, HIPAA requirements are one thing. There are regional requirements in each state in the United States that say, medical data must be stored for a certain amount of time. There's no uniform across even the United States law that says you must keep this X number of years. Um, some states have really long retention requirements. Some states don't have any. So there's this massive hodgepodge of requirements that these guys have to keep up with. And this is why they default to not throwing anything away. They put it all on tape because they're afraid to just get rid of it. They're afraid that in 10 years, someone's gonna say, well, why didn't you keep that for 15 years? Mm -hmm. well, so we a weren't told to. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of this, a lot of this conversation basically sounds like it's an archive solution to replace tape. Okay, um, which has, or at least augment is, tape, because yeah, in is, many cases they want to keep tape for whatever requirements. Right. Well, so it, it takes you were talking energy. about you know, simpl mm -hmm. simplicity and, and so on. So that's a vast oversimplification of what cloud is, because that there are other solutions that are like uh, you have cache before you go to tape and other bits and pieces. Um, so is this really cloud stuff, or are you just talking about an archive storage system? I, I bel well, the initial product that we have launched is an active archive, and it is we're targeting that at the um, at that I'm calling it that new opportunity between traditional um, storage and um, full tape archive. So this particular product, that is the target. That's why it's called the active archive. The company's vision and where we're going is to be a cloud infrastructure player as a whole, right? So this is obviously a long-term vision that we have. Critical to that is this software interface that allows you to be able to present to customers an S3 type interface or a cloud interface. Um, but we will continue to innovate on top of that. So that's one of the things we can do is just, we have the ability to, to innovate vertically down to the, literally to the platter level at a disk. So we can take advantage of um, both the physical infrastructure, um, but also provide the uh, overlaying, you know, software value add, like how you take care of your data and manage your data. Um, and even what you present externally, today we're presenting S3, we don't have to all just, we're not just S3, that's just the interface today because it is the number one interface for cloud. Well, it's one of them. I mean, the, the number one interface to cloud is an API. And the, I mean, the, the purpose of cloud is not just, hey, we put it somewhere else and it's someone else's data center. Mm -hmm. Um, and like no one really understands, you know, what the hell is actually cloud. I get, <laughs> I get it can nine be anything different. You want it to yeah. be. It is a very nebulous term. If you'll <laughs> forgive my comment. I mean, even, even at Amazon, though, there's a difference between S3 storage and and EC2. You yeah, know, exactly. So, yeah. so exactly. And that's the, and that's the thing. So one of the benefits of it, well, the two major benefits of it is one, you can turn it on really quickly, and the other one is you can turn, turn it, it off. off. You guys yeah. never turn it off. That's the whole point, is to keep everything forever. So again, I sort of go, yeah, so it's yeah. it's storage and it's long-term and it's it's cloud. So if it's the vision is to do cloud, what are the other bits gonna be? If you And you're talking down to the platter level, so we're talking hardware-defined um, storage and hardware-defined cloud. 
whereas everything else is talking about software and APIs and all of that sort of stuff. How does that fit in with, with your vision for being a, a cloud infrastructure provider? Well, we, if you think about it, our the real value add is our, our software layer on top of that. The, um, we talked at length about the AmpliData acquisition, which was, and which is, an, is a, you know, a geo-distributed object store. And that is in a very powerful, that is the value. Without that, we're just, you know, you're just rolling in a rack and expecting the user to have to, to build their, right. their infrastructure themselves. So when we say infrastructure, it is not a, it, the word I know has a hardware connotation, but we're talking about providing you the ability to be up and running as a cloud, whatever your cloud service that you want to provide, whether it's internally or externally, that that, that is there in that box for you. So it's that simple. I guess, okay. I guess it's, <coughs> it's the, the cloud word, isn't it? That's yes, that's what yeah. he's yeah. causing the, the yeah. tension. I don't see the elasticity no. that would also be part yeah. of that cloud. So I, well, it's elastic I mean, one way. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> and you're talking about to run, so really to run workloads project. and to do cloud stuff. It's like, well, yeah, I need storage. Awesome. But I right. need to run applications. You're saying, Absolutely. Yeah, the and applications so don't run on the storage. I need no. networks. I need compute. Right. I need load balancing. I need routers. I need firewalls. I need and, security. And so without announcing any future products, because I, I think that would be a bad thing to do, look for things like that coming from us. OK. And I guess this is just the first step down that path. Th cool. th there certainly is a, a value in a software accessible pool of storage oh, that yeah. may exist somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's, it's perhaps unhelpful to, to oversell that as a, a cloud. Because yes. it's not. It, it's a big bucket of storage I can get out with software. Correct. Which is yeah. very useful. Perhaps we should but say But just a big bucket of storage cloud. I can get at. <laughs> yeah, but that's what Intel tells you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't, so, don't but that's, steal that's, Intel a, that's a really important point because you were saying before that you're talking about this market that you're going after that actually doesn't understand what you're trying to do mm. and doesn't understand that area. So you've got a long education process required just as part of your sales cycle. And if you're going to that market with a message which is actually off to the side a bit, yeah. not really that accurate. You're going to educate them, get them confused, and then right. you're going to sell some stuff to them somehow. And so you could actually be making your own situation worse later if you're going to bring out these other products. And it's like, well, but I thought you were doing that, and we understand this now, and now you've gone off over here. I think that's a great point, which is why, I mean, when we, when we are having conversations with customers, the conversations we're having are today with people who have that understanding. So they have a problem at the back end that they cannot easily scale their storage and it's growing at an exponential rate. But they have the language. You are absolutely right. We're not talking about entering into a traditional enterprise and saying, here, you, need, you know, put us in, uh, we're, we're just going to work. It's not like that. We're actually talking to people who already have the language, who have experience, who may have been trying to do it themselves. Most of the time, they've been trying to do it themselves. And it's very painful because that that integration up to, to getting the actual um, internal platform working is very painful, and they have the compute side to worry about too, and the networking side. Mm -hmm. So you're right, we're, we're addressing one third of the challenges for, the, for a full cloud. Um, and then there's the application on top of that again. Mm -hmm. But what we're saying is we'll take this pain point away from you because it is a very complex, um, you know, in general, just getting the, the compute piece is generally relatively easier than is the back-end storage piece because it involves networking, it involves storage control, it involves software layer, and it involves the actual physical infrastructure. And, you know, I've, we've all been in the storage industry a long time, and any one disk drive is, has a different personality than another disk drive. So the idea that you've got, I can use any disk drive with any enclosure, with any, you know, motherboard out there, with any firmware level, um, that is actually that is actually a, a, you know still a very complex ecosystem